15 second introduction is held. Good morning, my name is Jules Freed. I'm here with my associate, Frank Ball. Uh, we are in the business of helping early stage companies achieve uh, <clears throat> higher levels of, levels of performance. Um, what's interesting about me is a couple of things I think about. One, I was born in the Bronx. A lot of people don't admit that when you're here at Sox Nation. You can take the boy out of the Bronx, uh, the kid out of the Bronx, you can't, the, you can't take the Bronx out of the kid. So I'm still a New York Yankees fan, New York Giants fan, and uh, it's going to be an interesting season all around. Um, the other thing that's interesting to me, actually, is it might be interesting to you, is I actually got started uh, uh, in entrepreneurship at the predecessor to an S group run by Michael Belanger, the Group 128 Venture Forum. I stood up many, 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 many years ago at a group grouping like this. And the format was somewhat different. They would, Michael asked us to explain what we did and sit, sit down. Uh, I thought I needed to do something that was attention grabbing, <clears throat> and uh, because I wanted to distinguish myself from the rest of the group there, I limited my pitch to four words. I said, I read business plans, and I sat down. And some people in the audience thought that meant that I had access to money. Uh, I was approached by a gentleman who later became, became my partner. Uh, we collectively with some other people uh, founded a high-tech startup. Uh, ran that for 17 years after about 12 or 13 million dollars worth of venture capital in 500 two years in a row and sold it to a European multinational. So I traced my entire career in, in, uh, in the venture world and in entrepreneurship to forwards. All right, so with that as a, as an uh, as, as a background here, just to ask a couple questions. Um, how many people here have a perfect pitch? All right, very good. How'd you get it? Uh, practice. No, you didn't get it to practice. Not possible. Okay, anybody else? Perfect pitch, or someone's called absolute pitch? Do you have, is it perfect, oh, absolute? Oh. No, I thought you just meant like, my pitch is perfect. Like specific. <laughs> no, no, no. Well, perfect pitch is a, is sometimes referred to as absolute pitch. It's the rare auditory ca uh, capability or phenomenon characterized by the ability to uh, recreate a musical note uh, perfectly just from nothing. Very, very, very rare. Right? I'm not surprised that no one has, it, has that. There's a, something called relative pitch, all right, which is the ability to um, uh, identify or recreate uh, a pitch, musical pitch, from a reference point. So I'm not going to give a pitch today, but I'm going to give you some reference points that might, you might be able to use uh, in terms of your own pitching or people you work with. Uh, and hopefully you'll find that helpful. And the key thing about relative pitch is it can be learned, it can be trained, uh, but you have to work at it to, perf to perfect it. So with that as a, uh, as a segue, very quickly, I'm going to try to do five things today. Give you some five, five things. They all have lists associated with them. One, I'm going to descri <clears throat> describe what a pitch deck is, what I think it is. We're going to talk about what a pitch deck is. Two, I'm going to list seven things that a good pitch deck should contain in the form of questions that must be answered. Number three, I'm going to indicate ten things you absolutely, positively must know before you can successfully pitch your business or your business plan to potential investors or at least to someone with some sophistication in the, pro in, in the process. You can pitch your Aunt Harriet as long as you want. You don't have to know anything. She's going to love you, and she'll either give you money to help you or not. Nothing to do with what you say. Um, th these questions are usually not, you, you'll find them, I think you'll find them different and not in standard pitch outlines. Number four, I'm going to identify to go with the 10 must-knows as 10 no-knows. Okay, things you should, that are immediate turnoffs when pitching to investors. And last, I've got a bunch of miscellaneous suggestions on how to perfect your pitch, understanding it is never going to be perfect. So just to get started, so who knows what a pitch deck is? Anybody volunteer yet? Gentlemen here, what's a pitch deck? That's the slide deck that you use in giving the pitch. It's to cover the key points in whatever allotted time you have with the investor group. You're okay, meeting. that's a good definition. Anybody else? Anybody else have any ideas? I, 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 Characterize a pitch deck as three things, all right? And describing it, and I just take some time here to describe it because it's based on purposes and utility as opposed to content. And if you keep the purposes in mind, Stephen Covey proceed with the end in mind, keep the purposes in mind, I think it will, you'll take your, whatever you do to a higher level. So three purposes. 
Okay. Number one, raising capital is a process. It's a sales process. A pitch deck is a sales tool. I view it as a sales tool. Regardless of the form of the investment instrument you're seeking, you're selling yourself, you're selling your business, you're selling your vision, you're selling a share of the financial reward. I'm a Dale Carnegie trained salesperson. All right, you're always selling. So it's a sales tool. Every good salesman has a, has a toolkit. Today, the 15 to 20 minute pitch deck has become the key sales tool in the capital raising process, no matter what you're doing. Uh, angel investors, VCs, angel groups, strategic investors, they all, although their needs differ, they all are gonna to wanna to see some kind of a pitch deck usually. It was not always this way. Back in the day, okay, uh, we used to write 20 to 30 minute long form copy business plans. They were a bear to write, all right? A bear, I can tell you from my own personal experience, got paid a lot of money for some, it didn't matter how much money I was paid, they were very, long form copy that is legible, consistent, coherent, is a very difficult task. We don't seem to teach writing anymore. Um, very few people actually read anymore. Uh, so they have kind of fallen into disuse. But that doesn't mean it's not a good idea to still do that. Okay, good. All right, so, but don't forget you're gonna need lots, it's one of many tools in your toolkit. You're gonna need lots of others. You're gonna need an elevator pitch. You're gonna need an email teaser. You're gonna need a one page overview. You probably need a two page executive summary. You need a functional website, financials, lots of things. But the key, presentation item is going to be your investor pitch deck. So what sells? Lots, lots of things sell. Enthusiasm, third-party validation, uh, well-articulated benefits, all the stuff that you know is in a pitch deck that's important. But a well-articulated and organized presentation that covers all the bases uh, that the audience wants to be convinced about before spending any more of their precious time with you. Remember, one of the things you are taking from your audience is their time and you better make it useful. Right. Second, and this is actually, pe people don't, I've never had anybody suggest this as, an, as, a, as a purpose of a pitch deck. To me, it is the most critical piece. A pitch deck is a forcing function. Everybody know what a forcing function is? Okay, good, we got some heads that are going up and down, that's the right direction. A forcing function is something that forces you to do something else. If you do a pitch deck right, it will force you to think out your business and your business plan and articulate it in a way that mere mortals can understand, people who are not in love with your technology, and are in, but are interested enough to actually sit there. So the forcing function is critical. Nothing frustrates an experienced investor more than an interesting idea where the investor has to do the work, do the work to see if it makes any sense or not. Lots of good ideas fail at this step because the investor class simply does not have the time or the energy or the patience to, do, to think through all those things and connect the dots. Number three, all right, and this is actually, it may even be more critical, all right, and most inexperienced entrepreneurs don't understand this either. Okay, a pitch deck is an opportunity to show how good a communicator you are. Why is that important? Independent of the content of your opportunity? It's important because, depending on who you ask, communications and the ability to communicate can be 50, 60, 70, 80% of the requirements for success in business, particularly at the CEO level, all right? Uh, the CEO is always the communicator in chief. People who are thinking about investing in you and your company want to know how well you communicate to them because you are going to have, communicate, have to communicate to others to be successful. Uh, is a great communicator always a great CEO? No. Uh, can a poor communicator be a great CEO? Sure. Okay, but if you cannot sell investors, they are gonna ask how you can sell other sources of capital, customers, partners, employees, etc. So keep those three things in mind as you go through your presentations and your preparation for presentations. A sales tool, you're always selling. A forcing function, have you thought through the whole process? And number three, are you communicating well with what you have? I have 40 years as a communicator. I started uh, my, my business career as an attorney. Uh, I taught legal writing. Um, I've been speaking and doing these in front of audiences for years. You're always learning. Okay, number two, what is in a pitch deck? What are the contents? Okay, there are, you can go on the web. You can find lists of what to include. It's fairly standard, lots of places to go. Only problem, everybody's got their own names for them, all right? And they're different. 
So how can you rationalize all that? I boil it down to seven things. I call them the seven deadly questions. Why? Questions, why? Because I frame them in a way to think about answering the questions that are in the mind of the audience. I'm kind of a, I've been, uh, I've had a, I had a 17 year career, uh, tutorial in marketing and selling uh, through someone, an agency that I hired for a company, for the company that I, I was involved with. Oh, you can, Lou Gerstner talked about this when he took over IBM. He said, we're going to rebuild this company from the market back. The market in this case is your audience. Always think from the audience back to what you're selling. It's not what you are interested in, it's what they are interested in. And deadly, because if you don't answer these questions successfully, you're dead. Right. Very simple. All right. Okay, here are the questions. Question number one. Alice in Wonderland. What does the Mad Hatter say when Alice comes down? Who are you? You'll be surprised how many people forget to introduce themselves and understand who they are. Very simple. Who are you and what business are you in? You can do that simply. You cannot believe how many people get up and fail to introduce themselves. Short, crisp introduction of you, your team if they're with you, and where your businesses are, what service or product you offer. It's very, very simple. Good morning, my name is Jules Fried. I'm here with my partner, Frank Ball. We are in the business of helping early stage companies achieve their objectives. Now you, you know who I am, you know what I do. Question number two, what is the opportunity? Now this is a, maybe a different formulation from what people have heard before. Opportunity is usually the intersection between a problem and a market. All right, I state it a little differently. Best, the best business opportunities have big problems in big markets where the problem is growing and the market is not going away. All right, I've seen some wonderful solutions to very interesting problems. And oh, by the way, the regulation is going to change in 18 months and this will no longer be an opportunity. Oh, well, we better move quickly or out of this room because that's not what I want to invest in. All right. So number two, so lots of ways to say this, what, you know, market need analysis, the problem to be solved. In words of one syllable, what is going on in the world that makes it worthwhile to invest time and money and energy to improve upon the state of the art in what's going on? How big is it and why should the audience care? What's the opportunity? It's not a market analysis, all right? It's not a problem discussion. It's the confluence of those things that create an opportunity. Number three, question number three, how do you propose to capture this opportunity? Very simple. What's your solution to the problem? How are you going to bring that thing to market? It's not just, it's not a product discussion. It's not a technology discussion. It's a solution discussion. How are you going to solve the problem? Not what the solution is, that's part of it, but how all of the things that go into solving this problem that you, or capturing the opportunity that you see in the marketplace. Why is it different and why do customers care? Number four, what could go wrong? What could prevent you from being successful and how are you going to overcome it? Sophisticated investors know that every, there's a bump in every road, usually more than one. If you haven't thought about the, bump, the bumps in the road and, come, and anticipated them, you're not going to be perceived as being a very sophisticated uh, uh, person. There are always some, get them out there, address them. So not, usually it's called, just called competition. Competition, you need to identify your competitors, uh, how you're different, and how you can validate the difference, but competition is too narrow a way to talk about the challenges of being successful. The biggest competition in most industries is sales inertia. Okay, no decision. How many people sold sales? Right, right. Well, who's your, big, your biggest competition in sales? It's usually not the competition, it's no decision. Okay, and time is the enemy for all entrepreneurs. Why? Time is money. Time, your burn rate keeps burning, the revenue's not coming in, the spending is going on, the intersection with positive cash flow keeps getting closer and closer, and you run out of money. Inertia is usually, usually the biggest uh, preventer. The sales rep takes longer. But it's the, the bullet you don't see that kills you. You're not the only person in the world to, to see this opportunity. Give some thought also to what other people are doing. Anticipate possible pitfalls as best you can. Patents and IP it can be challenges, it can be pluses and minuses, lots of stuff go into that. Question number five, who is going to make this happen? That's the way I, who is going to make this happen? And why should I bet on them? Now you'll, most places you'll see the section for a, a business plan or a pitch, the team, this is called the team, all right? Many calls the team. I don't like that formulation, I think it devalues the role of the CEO, okay? 
And that the VC expression is bet the jockey. They don't say bet the jockey, the horse, the trainer, the stable boy, the owner, you know, the guy who makes the feed. No, no, no. Bet the jockey. So the CEO, the team supports you as the CEO. That said, you can't ignore your team, and you want, and you, there are critical components, the board, your advisors, even early investors, they all reflect on you as CEO, and it shows your ability to attract talent, or your lack of ability to attract talent, or your thought that you actually need the talent. Right? But make no mistake, um, the investor wants to know why they're gonna bet on you. Uh, so, and if you, if, you, if you think you can answer this question positively, you can keep going. All right, why are you the best person in the world to capture this opportunity. You've seen it, it's there, we believe it. Why are you gonna make it happen? Very tough question for most people to answer. Question number six, how do you make money? Alternately stated is what's the business model? You can, you cannot believe the number of pitches I have seen that do not clearly articulate this. Solutions to problems, even big ones, do not magically turn themselves into money. You must explain how you will generate revenue and hopefully profits. Okay, so the, this requires identifying your key customers, pricing, discounting, average account size, projected uptake, the sales and distribution model, the revenue model, the key metrics, and how, how far the money you're going to get is going gonna, is gonna to take you. Of course, this doesn't apply to every single type of business. Let's be clear. Most of it. Okay. If you're developing a drug that's going to cure cancer, all right, you're probably never going to see revenue with your company. You're going to take it, you're going to spend 50 or 100 or 200 or 250 million dollars, you're going to get it through some phase one, phase two studies if you're lucky, and then you're going to sell to some big pharma company, and then they're going to spend the 500 million or billion dollars necessary to get it proved in the market and, and, and generate revenue. That's a different business model. Okay, that's, a, there you have, that's an expense model. There's no revenue to model. You know, okay. If you're developing some kind of web-based, uh, used to be, not so much anymore, uh, a web-based platform, maybe your business strategy is generate a lot of uh, unique customer visits and sell it to Google, all right? And you're not gonna worry about revenue, let them worry about revenue. That's a business model, all right? Usually not the, I don't know, anybody in this room have that model, those business models? No, I didn't think so. Usually this, you, you're trying to generate uh, re revenue. Okay. Question number seven, how does the investor make money? And this is a separate question. And this is, what does the, this, what, this question asks, what do they get for their money? What is, what's likely to become of it? Here's where you ask for the order, essentially. How much, uh, outline how much money is needed to make the business successful. What you think they want to pay, expected valuations, milestones, things like that. If you answer those seven questions completely, I believe you have actually covered the landscape of anything an investor wants to know. There are some questions under all those things, but, but that pretty much covers it. All right, so what do you have to know? So the seven deadly questions are real easy to state. Answering them is not so easy. It requires a fair amount of work. So I got generated lots of lessons from giving and listening to more investors' presentations than I can count. I could spend the whole day going through do's and don'ts. I boiled them down to, again, 10 no's and, and, and 10 no-no's. You must know what business you are in. This sounds simple. But, you, but often, you, and it's usually one business. One company I recently saw had a very interesting business idea, I thought, for reagents, reagent selling. I like the reagent business. Uh, it's a consumable, it's, it's repeatable, the market's easy, easy to identify, you've got a lot of research labs doing research, no regulatory requirements, et cetera, et cetera. And the, and the team had done it before, very nice. But he also had a little software overlay that they wanted to do for reordering and things like that that they were gonna use as a platform to kind of and it was not clear to me that this was one business or two businesses. You usually in one business. And if you're small and starting up, you usually don't have the resources to be in more than one business. So you've got to think that. Number two, know your milestones. What are the key points along the way that will, that will show you, uh, demonstrate pro progress to you and to your, and milestones are not calendar dates. They're actual accomplishments that are important to the business. And if you cannot articulate milestones, then you probably can't manage your business with your other people. Number three, know your value inflection points. Not the same thing as a milestone, all right? Filing a regulatory filing of 510K, for example, in a, uh, a medical device company is a milestone, but it may not be in a value inflection point. Getting the 510K 
may increase your value. And why is that important? That's important for developing your capital plan. Because you, you will have different valuations at different points in time based upon what you have accomplished. So you have to know your value inflection points. Know where your money's gonna go. And more importantly, where it gets the company after you spend it. This is a function of two things. How much you raise, how, how fast you spend it, and what it takes to get to the next milestone. This is not the same, same thing as use of funds. All right, use of funds is kind of easy. People go use of funds. Well, we're spending on this, 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 and this. Ignores the function of time, which is critical to every entrepreneur. Uh, the corollary to knowing this is you will know when you next you need your next uh, fundraising, and then you've got to back in from that how much time it takes us to raise your next round. And the problem you may run into is that you have to start raising your next round of capital the day after you close your existing round of capital. And CEOs are rapidly growing and technology companies who are trying to take advantage of market opportunities that are fleeting find they are constantly in capital raising mode. It comes with the territory. Know your investment thesis and the key assumptions behind it. What's an investment thesis? Or what the investment thesis, these are the critical things that need to be true for you to make money, for the business to be successful. The investment thesis is you will receive a 510K and for so many dollars in so much time, you will get these amount of sales in so much time, all right? You will interest these strategic partnerships in these time frames, all right? Those are the, usually time is a component that's ignored, all right? Number six, know your exit strategy. How are the investors gonna get liquidity? And when, and at what price? You have to know your market. Know your, mar know your market doesn't mean just label your market. It means know with precision what the market forces are, what the drivers are in that market, who the other players are, things like that. Okay. Uh, number eight, know your value proposition. This is different than this is different than benefits. This the value proposition relates to someone in the market, usually a customer. What benefit are you to them? All right, and do that in dollars and cents if at all possible, and how is the customer gonna justify purchase of your product? And is this a, a problem that the customer knows they have, actually? You may think so, uh, but this is usually true for tech. Again, Steve Jobs did a great job selling things. People didn't know they had, but these, they had these needs until he sold them, okay? Things are sold like perfume. There are certain kinds of businesses where you generate demand. That's not usually a high-tech business, okay? Consumer product, fashion, not high-tech business, usually. Okay, um, number nine, know how to validate your claims. All right, in sales, you get a lot of what I would call bald assertions, okay? Bald, so a bald assertion is not a validated claim. You want to be able to put, I used to be a trial lawyer, you have to pile evidence upon evidence upon evidence that your claims about the marketplace are real. And number 10, this is, I think is the most important part really is know what you do not know and say so. I, think, I don't know if Dick Cheney invented the phrase, but he popular, popularized it, the notion of known unknowns. Rumsfeld. Rumsfeld, that's the guy, right. Okay, same, same administration. Same, 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 same administration, okay. All right, so those are the 10 things you must know. 10 no-nos, I'm gonna give you the no-nos. No-nos, don't do this. No Chinese math, anybody know what Chinese math is? No, very surprised. Chinese math, one billion Chinese, all right, if I get one-tenth of one percent to shave with my new razor every day, I will have a $100 million business. That is Chinese math, okay, all right? So uh, hand-waving is kind of a slight variation on, uh, on Chinese math. You don't actually use the number of Chinese in China. You kind of say, well, at the hand-waving level, this is a $500 million market. No, 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 you don't. Hand-waving is also a no-no, okay? You make yourself sound erudite by throwing around terms like total addressable market and say you're gonna start here and you're gonna grow revenue 30% percent a year. That's all Chinese math. Okay. It's, it's all top-down market project, mark, revenue projections are all Chinese math. Start at the bottom, build it up. You can't sell the second one until you sell the first one. When are you going to sell the first one? When are you going to sell the second one? Over what period of time? Okay, no, no, number two. No, MIGO. No MIGO presentation. Anybody know what MIGO is? M-E-G-O. Acronym, four-letter acronym for my eyes glaze over. <laughs> okay. You got to keep it interesting, all right? Um, number three, no apologies. If you do not have, so have something you know, or you don't, or you have, haven't filled in a blank, that's fine. Just say you don't know it, but don't apologize. Okay, apologies connote a weakness or a lack of confidence. 
you just keep going forward. No jargon. Unless you are a seasoned veteran, jargon sounds te terrible, terrible. I listened to a pitch from a couple of kids from Yale. They're very energetic. They were very uh, um, telegenic. They were very uh, passionate about what they did. They were very smart kids. But they were saying, we were, people were asking about proprietary technology, and one of the guys said, well, it's not an IP play. Right? It sounded like you've been in this business 40 years and been invested $200 million. It was not appropriate for it. That kind of jargon was not appropriate. Um, a better way of answering that is something like, well, while we expect to have patented, protected technology, we're not relying on our intellectual property to grow our business in this exciting market. That's an answer. Not an IP play is not an answer. All right. Number five, no TLAs. TLAs are three-letter acronyms. Um, I'm getting a few smiles here. People know, people know exactly what I'm talking about. One entrepreneur I was with, he, said, he kept, kept saying MVP, 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 okay, to this medical device presentation. I had no idea what he was talking about. <laughs> okay, I walked up next to a very experienced medical device executive, and, and I asked, I said, what was he talking about? He said, I think he was talking about most valuable player. <laughs> <laughs> he was using that to, to target the, 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 the profile of the key customer that they were after. Don't use three letter acronyms. No falling in love. You cannot do not fall in love with your technology or your product. All right, all right. You can only the technology is irrelevant. The product is irrelevant. The only thing that matters is what your technology and product do for a customer when they need. So you can capture an opportunity. So you can generate revenue and make profits and make money for your investor. Do not fall in love. Okay. Number seven, do not ask for too little money. Biggest mistake of most early stage companies, undercapitalized. Undercapitalized. It's actually not that much harder to raise the right amount of money than to get started with too little money. Okay. Big mistake. Um, worst thing that can happen to you is, uh, well, a very, very astute gentleman many, many years ago told me, I was explaining a business problem to him, he says, sounded like they raised just enough money to get into trouble. How many people know those companies? There's just enough money to get into trouble. Don't overvalue, don't overvalue your business. This is counterintuitive. Okay, early stage companies, I just met some guys, they said, we raised $250,000. I said, great, great. I said, what was your valuation? He said, $5 million. <laughs> okay. Uh, and now they, and they had, that's when they had nothing. Now they have a prototype. Had a semi-functional prototype, and they got, and they say, well, we're looking to go out for our next round, and we think we've doubled our valuation at $10 million. Oh, where'd that $250,000 come from? After three meetings, I learned, he said, this was the husband of the doctor who had the idea. So now they got a $10 million valuation because some of the husband. No. The problem of overvaluation at the early stages is you have to cram your investors down later. They get very unhappy. And your cap table is a mess. So don't overvalue your business. Number nine, don't say forecasts are conservative. Okay, it's a very conservative forecast, we're gonna blow through these numbers. No, never happens. Okay, don't say this is the last capital we're ever gonna need. No, doesn't gonna happen, okay, okay. You don't say you're gonna go IPO in a year. No, it doesn't happen, okay. So, and even if it does happen with you, say, that's called a positive surprise, okay? Positive surprises are nice. But you're much better off under promoting and over delivering the raising expectations. Plus, remember what people are thinking about. They want to know how you are. If you are unrealistic and over presenting, that's not actually good. People think it's selling, it's not. Okay. Number 10, don't let multiple questions from different people throw you. Anticipate your correct, know how to handle objections. Okay, from sales training, prepare yourself for that. All right. So I gave you the. Seven deadly questions, I gave you 10 must-knows, 10 no-knows. Here's some su miscellaneous suggestions on making a perfect pitch, and then I'll get off the stage here because we can... We could listen all day. We could, well, I could, yeah, I could talk all day, but I think people have other things to do. That's fine. So here are some final suggestions on how to make a perfect. Number one, as in everything, know your audience. Know your audience. Can I say that much? Who are they? What have they invested in before? What have succeeded? What has failed? If you're talking to a VC, where are they in the fund life cycle? Very, very important. Okay, very, very important. Uh, can you pattern match with what the investor has invested in before? Are you talking about an IT play to somebody who's a medical device investor? 
Well, then you, you, bet, you better know it. Now, interesting question is why they're listening, okay? But maybe they're looking to expand. You don't know, but know your, know your audience. If you can't pattern, mat, pattern match with something that they're doing already, then maybe you want to ask some questions before you do that. Know your time limits. Know your time limits. Okay, and that was very nice. She gave me a very fuzzy time limit, so I'm not watching it too closely. I think I'm about on time, on time here. But you have no idea how varied your time allowance is likely to be. But here's just a few. The New England Health Executive runs a summer social showcase for entrepreneurs. You have one minute. The Fenway Fast Pitch Competition gives you three minutes. And that's Piranha Pond gives you five minutes. The M2D2, uh, where I've been a Shark Tank executive, gives you 10 minutes. Mass Medical Angel, I think, gives you eight minutes. Okay? So the five minute pitch is different than a 10 minute pitch, which is different than a 45 minute pitch. You better know how much time you have, and you better adjust your presentation to meet that time frame. All right? This is not easy to do. Okay. Good rule of thumb is two minutes per slide, but that's just a rule of thumb. My suggestion in versioning your pitch in ter terms of how to accommodate these time limits is to do the following. This is work. Take my seven questions. You make seven uh, columns out of them. And then you have rows for every time. Let me give a one minute, three minute, five minute, eight minute, 10 minute, 15 minute. And then you can populate your boxes in your table with the information that you can get out in those time frames, okay? Now, you don't have to do that all at once in the beginning, but at least for your first pitch, you know you got five minutes, what can I get in in five minutes? And practice it, okay? Secondly, you're gonna need versions that have that are for reading and versions for presenting, right? A lot of people wanna see pitches in advance, okay? The pitch in advance is closer to my 20, 30 long form copy presentation than it is to something sitting up here. Best presentation that I've, I've ever done or ever written has um, one word and one graphic per slide. Very successful. Okay. Because I don't want the audience reading the slide, I don't want listening to me. Okay. Right. So, so, so know your time limits. Number, next, use stories to tell your story. Once upon a time in a kingdom far, far away, <laughs> there lived a beautiful princess, okay? There was a reason fairy tales are compelling. They engage us, all right? They don't, so don't just present your business and technology. Make it a story about you and your team and opportunity and the market and what compelled you to get in and why the investors you find is compelling. Next, simplify, simplify, simplify. As Einstein said, this is a wonderful, wonderful book. Only Einstein can think of this. Everything should be made as simple as possible, but no simpler. Okay. And if you're as brilliant as Einstein, you can do that. So I like to say I'm reducing complicated things to the third grade level, but boil it down, keep boiling until you distill to the essence. Don't worry about nuance and background. Plenty of time for that later. If you hook the audience with your, that they'll want to learn more in the last questions. If they're not hooked, they'll be polite, and you'll never hear from them again. Okay. Connect the dots. Connect the dots. Way back in second grade when you had to make those dark, you had to connect the dots. All right. There is a, a rhythm and a connection to everything that goes with an entrepreneur story. Okay, it starts with opportunity and money and sales and marketing and spending and revenue. And you have to actually connect all those dots to how what you're gonna do is gonna lead to sales, which is gonna lead to revenue, which is gonna lead to profits, which is gonna allow you to afford to do more R&D, which is gonna allow you, allow you to get to a certain point. There's a story there. Most folks under, um, under understand, if you will, the financial plan as it relates to the story they are telling, as it relates to the capital plan that you need to fund your business. Focus, focus, focus on what investors care about. Uh, 20 slides is about the absolute maximum, less if you only have five or 10 minutes. You can uh, put stuff in backup slides. Practice, practice, practice. Your wife, your girlfriend in front of the mirror, in front of the cat, whatever. Take yourself if possible. Uh, make sure it flows. Polish, keep polishing. Drop a name or two, show some passion uh, in your presentation. Uh, don't confuse profits with cash flow. No, 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 no. not the same thing. Um, make as good an impression, first impression as is possible. The San Francisco 49ers, Joe Montana, everybody old enough to remember Joe Montana. But you know what they did at the beginning of a game? You know that? They scripted the first 20 plays. 
didn't know what happened to the plays, didn't know the deep matter what the defense did, didn't matter the game situation. They ran the first 20 plays. Why? They knew what they were doing for 20 plays. Get your, make sure your opening is strong, make sure you close strong. In the, in the middle, it can be a bit more of a muddle. That happens sometimes. Um, I'd like to conclude by framing the situation you're going to be in here. Your pitch deck has one purpose and one purpose only, which is to get your audience to take the next step in the sales process. No one, I've yet to find anybody who got a check after he delivered a pitch. Does not happen. At best, happened to, happened to me many, many years ago when I first got started, he said, come by my office. <laughs> Jules, come by my office Monday and I'll give you a check. But not at the presentation. <laughs> Okay, running out of time, so I'll leave you with one thought in terms of if you take away nothing else from this. Give it, get feedback, go back, give it again. Okay, the more you do it, the better you will get. It's a work in progress. It will never be perfect. Um, I hope you found that helpful. Uh, if anybody has any questions, I'm happy to stay and answer.